All right, this is our first video for our uh, unit on the legislative branch. The first thing we need to talk about is committees. We've already done the work out of the Constitution dealing with the structure and organization of Congress and how we have two houses. We've got the bicameral committee. What we need to talk about now is where they actually get stuff done. And again, we have 100 members in the Senate, and so it's almost impossible for them to get together and get meaningful work done as a large group. So just like anything, what they do is they divide things up into smaller committees. The other thing is that, remember, we're trying to solve huge problems in our country that are very, very controversial, very divisive. And so what we do is we try to get people to be experts. It's impossible for somebody to be an expert in everything. If you think about the diverse topics we're going to deal with, whether it's immigration, taxation, foreign policy, um, the environment, all of these require a very select set of knowledge. So what we try and do is have senators and representatives focus on a couple of key areas. Our, the main thing I want you to get out of this PowerPoint and this uh, lecture is the different types of committees. Again, when I give notes, this helps you understand how the test should be laid out. When I give you something like there's six different types of committees, you should automatically know that there's going to be a section on the test that's going to say, identify these six. Much like the last test that said, all right, here's the six different types of propaganda. What is this an example of? So we can expect on the test that we're going to have this section broken down. Our first session of committees is a standing committee. When we talk about standing, think about the term standing water. It means water that's kind of always there. It isn't going to go away. These are permanent committees, meaning that they never disappear. We have these for issues that we know are going to come up. <clears throat> there are certain things that we're always going to have to deal with, and so it makes sense to have committees that are permanent. Examples of these are the Ways and Means. This is a committee that deals with budgeting. This is dealing with how much money we're taking in. This deals with how much money we're going to pay out, all that kind of stuff. Agriculture. We're always going to have to deal with um, agriculture issues, farm, budgeting, resources, rules. These are all different examples. The Senate has 17 and the House has 19. Now this is another tip-off that will help you understand stuff. For example, we're learning about Congress. There are two Houses of Congress. One thing you should be prepared to have to understand is how are the Senate and how are the House different? Uh, right away in first hour when somebody's working on the Article 1 scavenger hunt, they ask that even. How are they different? Well, that's what you're learning. Now, the House has two more committees than the Senate, and one of the reasons is because every bill that deals with money, every deal, deal, uh, excuse me, bill that deals with apportionment, in other words, how we take in or spend money, has to start in the House of Representatives. So they're going to have to deal with a couple of issues that the Senate won't. What a standing committee done, does then is they study the bills before being presented to Congress. Uh, if you remember the, the goofy little schoolhouse rock thing about I'm just a bill, there's thousands of bills that are written each year. And we only select a few that end up getting a chance to become laws. And so in order to help kind of disseminate this and look at which stuff needs to get done, which stuff needs to uh, go on and which is worth our time because there's limited time, what we're going to do is have these smaller committees study them. What their job then is after they study these bills is to recommend them or revise them. Revise means to change them before presenting them to their selected House of Congress. In other words, we go, yep, this is a good bill. We should go forward. No, this is an okay bill. If we change this and this and this, then we can send it forward. Or no, this, is, this has no legs. It's not going to get anywhere, so we should kill it. We, our second type of committee is a subcommittee. Again, this is why, uh, especially if you're in real, one thing they do a great job of is working on roots of words. The roots, the prefixes, suffixes. Sub means something below. So these are committees within standing committees that are below them. And they're going to deal with specific issues in the area handled by the committee as a whole. So for example, if we're going to have budgeting, um, as a committee, we will have a subcommittee that deals with tax, that will deal with um, expenditures, that will deal with long-term forecasting, that will deal with how we handle this. So again, these senators or representatives are going to become experts in that area. Third is a select committee. Um, if you think about anything that is termed select, a select group of people, the select choir, in general, these are special situations. They're things that we choose in order to deal with circumstances that don't always exist. 
So in the case of select committees, these are appointed to deal with issues that are not handled by standing committees. In other words, something comes up, we don't want to have people waiting around for something that happens once every 10, 15 years, or something that's unique. For example, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, we have an environmental protection um, committee, we have natural resources committees, but we don't have a committee set up to deal with the largest oil disaster off our coast. So what they're going to do is they're going to take a variety of people, form a committee to work on these unique issues. The most common example, though, is going to be scandals. So today we have uh, the General Petraeus, former head of the CIA, dealing with his sex scandal issue. We're not going to have people waiting around for sex scandals to pop up, and then they'll deal with them. When these pop up, we will form a committee, usually done with within the ethics committees, to pop up and deal with how to handle this. Because every scandal is going to be unique in the sense of what are the risks to the government. We're going to have arguments. Yes, we should hold our leaders to a higher standard of ethical behavior, but just because somebody has an extramarital affair, that doesn't mean it's government business. When it is the chief of the CIA, and we have this huge potential risk of leaks, and compromising of the safety of our troops, then we have to address it. Fourth is a joint committee. If you think of the term joint from woodshop, you think of a joint as any place that two things are combined. And that's what we're doing. This is where they connect. So a joint committee is going to connect a couple of different committees. Usually these are done to deal with bills. Let's say somebody in the House of Representatives proposes a solution, a bill. And the Senate proposes a solution, a bill. Well, it's really cumbersome if it's something that needs to get done to have both sides work on it separately because in order for a bill to become a law, the law has to be exactly the same, every single word, between the House and the Senate. And there's no way that's going to happen until they get together. So to skip to the end, we're going to form a, a joint committee where we'll take some representatives and some senators and they'll craft a bill together. Fifth is a conference committee. This happens halfway through the process. We have a House and a Senate bill that was passed that's different. Usually it didn't originate at the same time, otherwise they would have formed a joint committee. Most of the time, it's a bill has already passed one branch of government. In other words, the House passed their version, then it goes to the Senate, and the Senate didn't like some stuff and they changed it. Instead of sending it back to the House, well, they'll change it, and then it's go back to the Senate, and then they change it, and it keeps going back and forth. They'll form a conference committee. And these conference committees are going to look at the same bill, and they're going to try and make sure that they can come up with a compromise. Now, committee membership is one of the most important things that happens in a senator or representative's careers. This is how you get prestige. This is how you get powerful within that, is getting important membership. And... Depending on where you live, certain membership is critical. For example, if you live in Minnesota, you want to be on the Agriculture Committee. Why? Because one of the largest industries in Minnesota is going to be agriculture. So you want to be influential. This is a way for you to work to help your constituents. Your constituents are the people you represent. All right, how do you get on the committee then? It's based in proportion. Now remember, we've talked about proportion before. We're going to use the word proportion a lot in this unit in the term of proportional representation in the House of Representatives. Proportion means it's based on population. So if we have two states and the total population between the two is 10, and one state has six and the other has four, when we take representatives, we'll make sure that the larger state gets a little bit more representation. Again, think of the Virginia plan from our original Great Compromise. So committee membership is based on proportion to the number of members each party has in each house. Well, that sounds complex. It's really simple. In the Senate today, there are 54 Democrats in the Senate, and there are 46 Republicans. When the Senate forms their committees, all of the committees will have a very, very small Democratic majority, which means the Democrats get to dictate the agenda. In the House of Representatives, we have about a 35-member advantage to the Republicans. So in each House committee, the Republicans will have a small majority, which means they can dictate whether things pass. Immediately now you can see the concern about gridlock. Gridlock is a term that's used when we talk about like traffic getting stuck, or we talk about Congress not getting anything done. If we have the Senate 
controlled by the Democrats deciding what bills to vote on, and the House controlled by the Republicans deciding what bills to vote on, we don't necessarily have people pulling in the same direction. This is where we come up with the term bipartisanship and compromise, and we'll see how effective that is. The majority party, and this is critical, can control whether bills see the floor. In other words, they get to decide if any votes are even taken. Because if it doesn't pass the committees, it doesn't go to the floor. Whether the American people want it, whether the president wants it, it doesn't matter. And now we start to see why the president is not nearly as important as people think. Yes, he's important. Yes, he sets the tone. But Congress controls the laws. This is a way to keep people loyal to the party. And this is one of the concerns. This is what George Washington didn't, didn't, Washington didn't like about political parties, is people become loyal to parties instead of loyal to their own beliefs at times. In order to get on an important committee, you have to be loyal, meaning you vote for things that your party says are important. If you vote against the party, they will strip you of your committee titles, and you won't be able to participate in the important committees, which means all you can do is vote on the things other people send. It's based on loyalty and seniority. And this is why we end up with people who have been there a long time who control everything. Chairpersons. Again, a chairperson is someone in charge. They are the people who decide when the committees meet and hold hearings. They are the people who are chosen by caucusing, remember majority, or a meeting, and the caucuses are of the majority party. So in Maine, we have an independent senator. The question is, who will he caucus with? Who will he meet with? He'll probably side with the Democrats because he agrees with them more and they have more power. Simple, cut and dried. We will see you tomorrow.